going to introduce four of uh, the think tank members of the Cinema Spaces Network to you. The fifth, hopefully, is joining us, Chopa. He is shooting in Eastern Congo, where, as you might imagine, internet is not an easy availability. What we have thought is to present our collaborators, friends, first of all, with the video presentations that they have produced last year so that we get a sense of uh, where they work, what the spaces look like, uh, which they have in mind and where they are at home. Afterwards, they introduce themselves and we start going into the introduction. So we start with the film of Sunshine Cinema. Thank you for coming by. We're getting ready to start. Most of us, we hardly go to cinemas. There's no cinema volunteer. I think it's important uh, showing the African movies. So that people out there can know who we are as Africans. In the past, we had very few African-made movies. So these African-made movies, they define us. They portray what we are, what we believe in as Africans. I chose to become Sunbox Ambassador because I see many people, uh, young people, especially in my community, getting involved in wrong things like drugs, crime. So with this Sunbox, we will be able to educate people. I wanted to be part of real change in community. I think visual things have an impact in people's minds. Within my society, there have been uh, challenges where people have been actually failing to have conversations within a community openly. Some of the film it teaches people about activism and them having rights to speak out. I do what I do because carrying these films back to the communities, I know that I am bringing them hope. Sunshine Cinema is a solar-powered cinema network, and we work in South Africa, Zimbabwe, Zambia, and Malawi. We're based in Cape Town in South Africa. And the main premise for why we started the initiative was to make African films more accessible to African audiences, because too often they tend to end up in European film festivals like Berlinale, for example, but don't get screened on the continent to local audiences. So that was really the, the fuel for why we started the fire. And in February 2021, we sit with many exciting projects and plans. We are about to launch a 20 Sunbox ambassador program across South Africa with young people from rural areas. We are running virtual screenings. We are doing drive-ins. We have also moved over to doing some podcasts while we can't hold our bigger cinemas during the pandemic. And this has all been in the space of four years of growth that we have, uh, that, that have led us to this point. Thank you. So moving on to Khartoum, uh, we first want to see the presentation of the Sudanese Filmmaking Association. Even if it may not be so obvious by the look of things now, the remaining theaters in Khartoum are only shells of their former selves. Despite years of hardship that have taken their toll on the country, Sudanese filmmakers still persevere to tell their stories. Filmmakers like Jadala Jubara, the father of documentary cinema in Sudan, or Hussein Sharif, with his unique blend of documentary and experimental cinema. These people were pioneers of their craft, and that pioneering spirit has continued until this day. There is untapped storytelling potential in these fertile lands, but many seeds are yet to be planted. How you doing this? <laughs>
Mohamed, uh, you're joining us from Khartoum. Your member and maybe the driving force, I may say so, at least this is my impression, uh, of the Sudanese Filmmaking Association. Can you tell us uh, your plans? What has happened since you made this presentation? What's on your agenda in February 2021? Thank you for having us. Sudanese Filmmaking Association. Uh, our plans uh, lays under the the bullet point that uh, we are implementing a project of developing the young talents of uh, Sudanese filmmakers from skillful filmmakers to create a platform for an industry and to showcase the outputs through two channels. The first channel is an uh, OTT platform which is called Sudan Plus or S Plus and the other uh, is uh, a project of uh, Sudan Film House, which we are implementing its uh, uh, TSA to make it the main and the first uh, independent film screening. Thank you, Mohamed. Mm -hmm. uh, we are moving on to Nairobi and please show us the self presentation of the Nest Collective. Hi, we're the Nest Collective. Hello. We are The Nest Collective, a multidisciplinary group based in Nairobi, working with film, music, literature, fashion, visual arts, community building, and more to explore African, urban, and contemporary experiences. Since our beginning in 2012, we've hosted film screenings, workshops, talks, and film contests, created networks of support for funding and production of film content in Kenya, and made a couple of films of our own along the way. We are very proud to be participating in the Cinema Spaces Network and are looking forward to working with our fellow network partners to dream about the future of film production and cinema in Africa. Thanks for having us, The Nest Collective. Hello, Mjoki. Mjoki is one of the 12 members of the collective. Not all of them are filmmakers, but I think dominantly you are filmmakers, cinema activists. Njoki, tell us uh, today in February, where do you stand as a collective when it comes especially to your activities in creating new film scenes in Nairobi? Film in Nairobi has been quite um, an interesting space to be in, especially um, considering what the pandemic did to the ways in which people shoot. Um, for us, we were able to we were able to shoot two things last year in very kind of unorthodox ways. One of the films that we shot was remote. So we had um, a, a crew and whole setups in two completely different cities while we directed from Nairobi. That was a really interesting experience, um, negotiating between everybody's different Zoom situations. Um, the other thing that we were able to do was to be able to run a COVID safe set um, where we shot um, a feature film that we'd wanted to shoot originally in um, April. Uh, there was a lot of different things required in order to do that, uh, which, which, which included having to do some rather significant rewrites, as well as um, get on board, of course, um, as a standard industry practice, um, a health practitioner whose main job was to have the COVID kind of public health situation on set um, completely on lock. One really fun thing I don't know and maybe I'm using the word fun ironically um, is that happened was that um, the crew kept saying how um, the, the, the the health consultant was always walking around set sanitizing mm -hmm. everybody's hands really policing that masks were on every single moment um, until the point that they didn't have to be on there's also been a complete difference in the ways in which people are viewing um, um, premieres of films and I think a whole bunch of people including us because uh, the films that we're thinking through are going to have to be released this year and the rollout of the vaccine especially to people um, our age group slightly older slightly younger isn't going to get to us um, as far as our Ministry of Health says until possibly 
2023, 2024, unless we get very, very lucky, um, because they're, of course, doing a very staggered kind of rollout of the vaccine because of scarcity. And so what's going to happen is that, mm -hmm. of course, the essential workers, um, such as teachers, doctors, police, ETC, will definitely get the first batches, and then they're going to start from the very, very oldest members of our society, as they should. And so um, as regards uh, film, definitely there's still people who are doing um, a bunch of cinema premieres. Uh, for us, we're trying to look um, in different ways and we're really excited by the ways in which um, this kind of hybrid um, film, film, film screenings are going on. There's also an increase definitely in, 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 in online kind of screen panels um, and conversations about film. So it's quite an exciting space to be in. Swinging over from East Africa to West Africa, we are welcoming Sinagim B, a project that has been presented also within Berlinale quite a few times. Bernie is um, one, the, the CEO and one of the core members of an initiative in Burkina Faso, which has taken a dormant cinema, which existed for a very long time in the middle of Bobo Lasso and revitalize it. So let's look at the presentation of cinema, Sina Gimbi. This whole story started in 2012 in Bobo Yulasso, Burkina Faso, West Africa, where since 2005, there is no more screen, no more cinema, no more place, a space to watch movies. The Cine Gimbi will be more than a cinema. A part of the daily program that we will uh, have uh, for everybody, we will also propose uh, specific programs because we will have workshops for uh, the filmmakers, the producers, the distributors. We will also have, and we're starting right now, a program for the children, uh, like image education with the schools. We have the, the conviction that we have a role to play uh, for the cinema industry also, for the town, for the cultural revival of the region. And we still need to have around six, seven months of work to finish it completely and to open it for the public. Bernie is joining us. Uh, some of you might see him in other sessions because he's also the produ producer of Garderie Nocturne, a film documentary that is screening at this year's forum. Bernie, tell us about Sina Um where, you know, you, you said you don't give opening dates because of the pandemic. It has been prolonged for so long, so long, so long. But give us a hint of where you stand and what you're hoping for this year will bring. Thank you, Doro, and uh, hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be in this session. So, uh, for the moment, uh, exact moment that we are talking, people are working on the rooftop of the Sinegimbi today, um, and they are uh, fixing the rooftop. And so, uh, we are very happy to announce that um, the work which has been uh, stopped since one year, since the pandemic started, has restarted again, the work has restarted. So uh, we hope to reopen in a, maybe between four and seven months time. And meanwhile, uh, we are also doing a couple of activities, which are uh, mainly uh, school uh, film education. So we are starting uh, these days uh, to uh, propose uh, film programs in the schools. And this is a new program which has never existed actually in, in Bobo, uh, together with the, with the authorities, together with the schools, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And we are also working uh, on um, training for um, cultural and social um, uh, entrepreneurs. I don't know how you say, but it's, uh, to to train the cultural active activists who want to uh, professionalize themselves. So this is also some parts of uh, our tasks as, as, a, as a theater, which is more than a theater, actually. So this means that we can already start activities before the actual theater is completely finished. Because 
this is one of the main um, spirits that we have since the beginning is to offer more than a cinema. Uh, so this means, of course, a part of the you know the, the daily uh, programs. We will also have uh, trainings. We will also have uh, uh, activities for the for the for the city, for the youth, for the women, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Thank you, Bernie. Um, I will take the liberty of giving a slightly longer introduction to Chopakabambi. Uh, he is a producer, filmmaking, filmmaker based in Kinshasa, but he's not in Kinshasa today, so we hope he's joining us a little later. He's on a shoot in Eastern Congo, and we don't know exactly whether or not he's joining us. Uh, Chopa has made a very nice presentation of Sinenabizo. Sinenabizo in Lingala means, no, in English means uh, our cinema. It's um, an initiative that has been going on for three years. Let's take a look. Uh, you will also meet Chopa uh, as the anchor in the self presentation of Sinenabizo. Hello, my name is Chopper Kabambi. I'm a movie maker from uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Today I want to share with you our cinema project. We call it Cine Nabiso, which means our cinema. The project aims to build 20 cinema theater or more for people of all social classes. First, you have to know that in Kinshasa, there are no cinema theaters. A businessman recently opened a cinema, but entry fee is beyond what most can pay. I can't help and afford it. In addition, he screened only American movies. A local cinema, 44 places, Entry fee will be one dollar. My team and I have been working for two years on this project. We plan to screen not only American movies, but African, European, Asian, and above all, Congolese. We want to put our one films on display. Additionally, we attempt to help future filmmaker in the Congo. We have good stories. We have some films, but people are an hour of our efforts because there is no distribution. We need to learn cinema in our country, and we don't have to wait. We must act now, and we need all kinds of support. We want everyone who trusts us to help. Join us and we will build 20 or more cinema theater accessible to people of all social classes. I would like to open this round of discussion. We had a preliminary meeting. We were thinking of what might be really important because not everyone who is uh, with us in the session today might have had the privilege of attending uh, screenings, be it in Nairobi or uh, Burkina Faso, Sudan or South Africa. Uh, DRC. So we thought maybe it would be very interesting to have everyone asking for a moment which really uh, was crucial for you, where you understood something of the differences of cinema as a space uh, when you attend screenings in your various countries. All of you have been pre uh, several times to, to Europe, attended European festival uh, sessions, screenings. What, from your perspective, what was the moment when you understood the way of how we organize our new spaces has to be slightly different? If you could share some moments which were enlightening for you. Bernie is smiling. Please start. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will start this. Um, I'll go a little bit in the past. And when you mention a souvenir, what comes in my mind is uh, a great souvenir which happened in the 90s, in the middle of the 90s in Burkina Faso, where we had uh, 
where we started our roving cinema activities uh, with Sinomad, and we were in this very remote uh, village in the next to the border of Mali, and we had a, a screening uh, of Yelen, of uh, the great uh, Malian director Suleiman Sisse, a film which was released in 1987, and which is considered as one of the biggest uh, films on the, uh, from the African continent. And so we showed it uh, for this village. There was around 1,000 persons uh, attending the screening. And we were supposed to stay three days. And so we had like a program for each night. Of course, it was free, free, free of charge screenings, outdoor, and et cetera. And so we had our program and everything was settled. And, but then the next morning, uh, we received a delegation of uh, the oldest, the old people of the village who came to visit us in our house in the village. And they said, look, uh, you have to screen this film again tonight. And we said, no, we, of, we have other, other films, but we had no choice. They imposed us. And the second morning, the third morning was exactly the same thing. We had to show the same film three times because mm -hmm. apparently it was such a success and people wanted to see it again and again and again. And for me, this really impacted me also as a filmmaker on the power also of, of, of those films because this film, which was shot in, in Mali next, next to this, not, not far from the village actually, they, the people had never seen it. It was in their local language and it was really a mirror. Sidel, um, I want to mention on this occasion also that uh, Sunshine Cinema is closely co uh, collaborating with uh, Berlinale Talents. So you've had the chance of, for instance, attending Berlinale screenings, festival screenings here. When you compare with uh, you know, a regular, if I may say so, regular village screening and how you're setting it up. Could you describe differences or is there a special anecdote that would be able to give an impression to our um, guests here at this session? What, what, what are important differences built uh, on which you are building up on your concept? Sure, I think that the, the environment in which we screen has a big impact on the atmosphere. So we do pop-up screenings using a large-scale mobile cinema truck, as well as our cinemas that fit into a suitcase, the sunbox. So when we do our large-scale screenings, we are able to go into a village or a town or any kind of space and create a cinema experience, whether it be outdoors um, using our pop-up screen or a classroom or a shipping container. We can create a cinema experience um, regardless of the infrastructure that might be there. And obviously, when you go to you know these kinds of these European festivals like Berlinale, and you attend these very beautiful old cinemas, these independent cinema spaces that are very formal and very hushed and very comfortable and dark and quiet, there's a formality there that you that that is not the kind of events that we are hosting. So, for example, we did a tour of the boy who harnessed the wind up to Malawi, where we hosted a number of screenings of the film, which is in Chichewa, the, the dominant language of Malawi, in villages around tea farming communities. And we had expected maybe 100 people to show up from that village. And as more and more people learned about the screening happening, similar to what Bernie um, was talking about, Eventually, at the end of the film, I think there were about 600 people all crammed in front of the screen mm. watching the film till the very end. Doki, would you uh, continue giving a bit of your background, like when, with what expectations you go? Usually in Nairobi, uh, the nest is more or less working in an urban uh, surrounding, so you have kind of a different target audience than, for instance, Sidel when she and Sunshine are doing rural cinema screenings. Would you be able to tell us, you know, a key moment for you? 
Um, I mean, for us as the Nest, uh, first of all, we do a lot of multidisciplinary work, um, which also means that even the films that we make are very, very um, diverse. So one of the things that you will find is that each film will have a different audience in different contexts for different reasons. Um, and you'll find that screening, screening that film in particular places will invite certain kinds of audiences, will lock out certain kinds of audiences. And so if you want your film to be seen by a large number of different types of people, then you really have to um, figure out a screening strategy that makes sure that it screens in more than one type of place. You can't just kind of anchor it in a cinema and then wait for everybody to come there. Um, in Nairobi, you find that the cinemas tend to be very upmarket spaces. They tend to be kind of located in large shopping malls, which then means certain things about the price of a ticket. Um, mm. That can be very, very kind of, ex um, uh, kind, it, it, it excludes a certain people people uh, within the society for many reasons. Um, also, uh, not, not the least of which is that um, Kenya is also a very kind of securitized space because of the, the kind of um, attacks on public spaces that we've had um, that have been attributed to, to, to terrorism. And so in order to enter um, certain spaces, you have to be kind of patted down by a security guard who also has to search your bags, etc. Those security guards have also been known to be quite classist in their approach. And so there's certain types of people that they'll refuse to enter even a mall. Um, never mind the fact that the mall usually has a, a, a bank or a, or a supermarket as an anchor tenant. And the person could be walking in literally to buy um, a packet of milk or a loaf of bread, whatever. So it can get very, very tricky. Um, so in some senses, for some publics, um, the cinema is a wonderful place to do a premiere. Um, in many ways, online is also great for Kenya. We've been having a general trend of reducing prices of data. They're still not what we would call affordable when you look at the wider population, but the prices have been coming down um, over the last over the last few years. Um, and 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 because because there have been a couple more players entering the field, um, the market has become quite competitive in that regard. Thank you all for sharing this very, very different screening realities that are so vast, vastly different from each other that I would like to try and rope back if we have the topic of decolonizing cinema. That's an equally huge space and ambition. I wonder uh, if you go back in your experience, all of you have years and years and years of screening experience and plans for the years to come. Um, when, when we try to boil this down a little bit, what, before reaching your uh, position today, what was the initial moment where you said, well, this is in my decolonizing strategy, uh, that particular place where I need to start? Is it finding a space? Is it finding a team? Uh, is it you know, starting with um, screenings for small groups to get expertise? Uh, is it a particular film? If you go back uh, down the memory lane, how you've started, and if you would, um, if you would share with us how you've done it, and would you do? Would you take the same road again, or or where do you think is a good starting point for achieving, a, or, or for looking for a decolonizing strategy? Maybe I can start um, and I can speak to the, the idea of decolonizing cinema. I know one of the things that one of one, one of the things that happens with a word like decolonize is a very loaded word and, and, and people approach it with any number of different um, attitudes, different preconceptions, different and I and I feel I feel as though I mean the, the way that the way that it it is it is useful for me in the context of cinema is asking ourselves why do we see the way in which why do we see the way we see now why why do we value certain types of cinema the way we do um, as opposed to different types of cinema um, why are we drawn to particular aesthetics um, more than to different types of aesthetics even though film as we know is an infinite medium and there's any number of different ways to say things using film. Um, we generally tend to use Western standards to gauge whether a film is 
beautiful, whether it's aesthetic or has aesthetic value, how um, the narratives are constructed um, using kind of three act structures or following the particular parts of different directors and different uh, storytellers and different auteurs who generally tend to be white and male um, and heterosexual. Um, and we have to ask ourselves why that is. Why are there are constant references? Why do we call the films we call classic, classic, you, you see? And if we start to see the, 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 the things that are in common um, among what we call classic and what we don't, um, if we start to see the things that are in common among whose films do we tend to watch and whose films we don't, um, we'll, we'll then also start to, 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 to be in a place that can truly reflect about the idea of decolonizing. I think decolonizing is a process. I don't think it's a thing that you can say, I have decolonized my cinema experience. Yeah, so can I add to that? Um, I really agree with what Njoki is saying. And I think that something that gets missed about understanding the concept of decolonization is often just the, the, the starting off point of really looking at whose knowledge is privileged. This idea of this Eurocentric knowledge production or artistic expression, as Njoki has mentioned, being the baseline, determining the quality of something is part of the thing that needs to be dismantled. And even this idea of world cinema, you know, that there, there's Europe and America, and then there's world cinema, but any cinema product that comes from somewhere in the world is, of world cinema. And I think countries in the global south are really tired of this notion of always being viewed in those categories of world cinema, world music, this notion that we're still developing, we're still catching up to something of this Eurocentric standard. And that's really part of that process of that decolonization. And then it feeds down to the panels that you have, the funders that you have, the film crew that you have making those films. For example, in South Africa, a lot of the the latest films that might be in vernacular languages and might speak to local experiences aren't necessarily made by black South Africans. They're often made by white South Africans who are coming from a very particular position of privilege. And those are the spaces that also need to be decolonized to that, in that sense. Bernie or Mohamed, you want to add something on, on your idea of when it comes to, you know, looking, for instance, in Bobo, uh, from what I understand, Bernie Sinegimbi has done a lot of research uh, in order to find out what actually uh, do the people of Bobo expect from a cinema. Could you tell us a bit uh, about that particular approach that you didn't just land and came with your team and said, well, we are revitalizing the cinema and we know how to do it, but you were working with a lot of people who live in the vicinity and who have become part of the team. If you could share with us how you worked in, in that particular environment. Yes, actually, uh, this decolonizing uh, subject is very linked to the whole Sinegimbi project. Why? Because first of all, um, this, the cinema theaters, uh, in West Africa, at least, that I, what I know, were built by the colonials, by the French, and they, for their audience, were white before 1960. Most of the countries were independent in 1960 in West Africa. So cinema was something only for the colonials. And mm -hmm. Sinigimbi opened three years before the independence of the Upper Volta. And this was 1957, and this was the first theater in the whole, in this whole big region, which was uh, run by a local, an African, uh, somebody from the town. And so this is symbolically very important. And since 1957 to 2005, when this theater shut down for many reasons, uh, this, this theater was always a popular theater. Well, they had 700 seats outdoor every day, uh, even when it was rain, the, the, the film, the, the film was, was there, and it was a, a popular uh, theater. And for us, when we decided to refurbish it and to revitalize it, we always had in mind that we have to keep this popular character uh, 
in, this, in the center of, of, of the struggle. The Sudanese Filmmaking Association has decided not to revitalize one of those empty, dormant cinemas in Khartoum. Instead, you are uh, working on a project which you've called the Sud Sudan Film House, uh, where you want to work with containers. Tell us why you thought, as an initiative, that to have a good starting point for a decolonized cinema to not go to one of the old places, but why you rather have a new uh, space that you envision for uh, SFMA? Okay, as Sudanese Filmmaking Association, we came to know that cinema is an independent platform. So it should be independent. It should not be linked somehow with the government or any type of control. As a freedom of speech uh, requires the freedom of selecting the topics, freedom to showcase as a screen, whatever topics, films, any type of content that we want. So we plan to use container architecture uh, as inspired by uh, uh, our fellow members from uh, Cinema Spaces Network, we, we, we have been inspired by such a, uh, a motive of using containers, just like our fellow members, uh, to have our own independent film screening venue to provide an opportunity for uh, filmmakers, independently without the control of the government and before the decolonization topic uh, uh, we were under the control of the government we cannot make any public screening uh, till now if you want to make a public screening anywhere you have to have a permission from the government even after the uh, revolution succeeded uh, the new government still have laws in public screening and using the public utilities. Uh, mentioning that the, 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 the old cinemas, which have been closed by the previous Islamic regime uh, for certain years, were owned by uh, individuals, but under the supervision and under the control of the government. Mm -hmm. The properties were owned by individuals and families. Uh, now, it's in most of them are in court to uh, decide the ownership of those cinemas. So uh, this is a long story of inherited lands and properties that needs to be uh, followed up by a lot of uh, the decay activities. So this is a long story. So that's why we prefer to have a new, independent, uh, fully owned uh, screening venue by the Sudanese Filmmaking Association to have full control on both the property and the activities internally. Is there, are there any like uh, burning wishes that you would like to share with the public? For instance, to the world cinema in uh, an ending statement for this session? I have something I'd like to share on, in relation to that. I think that it's very important for the funders of films to fund distribution better. I don't think that there are enough funding has been put into the distribution and audience development space. And that has led to this continuation of a neo-colonial flow of films where they go out of the continent, they go to the film festivals overseas, but they really make it back onto local screens. And if they do, they end up on streaming platforms that many of the audiences that we reach cannot afford to access. And one of the biggest stumbling blocks that we come across is that we are a third party distributor. So we don't qualify for the existing distribution funds that exist out there because they are designed solely for the individual filmmaker to apply for distribution and marketing funding. But if that category was to be opened up a bit more to entities like ourselves, 
we would be able to qualify for more of that distribution funding. And with more distribution funding and more audience development, there's going to be more demand for local content. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a cycle that, that isn't complete yet. Thank you, Sidel. Yeah, Bernie. I completely agree with Sidel. And I would, I would like to add also, uh, I think one of the key problems is of course, uh, the, the share on a film on a co-production because it's it's nice to say okay it's co-produced co-produced very nice but when at the end you look on the contract what is the share of the african uh, country on the whole global budget meaning what 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 kind of power does this african company has uh, when we talk about international sales when we talk about distributions when we talk about future negotiations when the film is finished and this is crucial and i think that we 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 have to fight to to get more film produced where our rights as african producers are meaning also that we should get more money to do our films of course thank you very much for a very concrete tip to the world cinema fund uh, Mohamed, you also wanted to say something to this. Yes, uh, for, in my point of view, uh, we need to unite to protect our dreams in the first place, to grant uh, any country uh, of us to have its uh, protected uh, cinemas. Uh, and this inquires that all all of us should unite to encounter any uh, governmental or any domestic uh, statements that can close cinemas, just, just like what have happened in Sudan can happen in anywhere in Africa. So to decolonize the, 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 the cinemas, we have to uh, start locally and act globally, protecting your screens from being banned or closed or your activity uh, to be uh, stopped, this is rapidly happening in Sudan uh, through AIDS. And, 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 and we want to protect our uh, fellow members and members in CS to, to not suffer the way we suffer. So united, we can protect each other. We can uh, lobby to protect our mandates and to have uh, uh, an external funding or uh, support for uh, developing the industry. And when I say industry, I mean industry with a long-term strategy to, to, to support the talents and to fund the emerging filmmakers. Just like what's happening in Sudan, we don't have a cinema institute. We don't have a film institute in an official level. People from Sudan travel to Egypt, travel to Europe to study and to learn cinema. So uh, this is my point. To, to, to vitalize and to uh, ensure that the, the root structures are protected for such cinema spaces to grow up and develop uh, without the influence of governments or the external factors. So uh, the new colonial uh, impact of, uh, uh, on cinema spaces is internal in Africa. And then we can, we can think externally. So we should unite to protect our screens. Thank you very much, Mohamed, for this uh, strong statement for the end. For me to wrap up, it's to say a big thank you to all four of you and to Chopa, even though he wasn't here with us today. He's been very, very actively like uh, all the other four initiatives in the Cinema Spaces Network. Thank you very much to World Cinema Fund, to Berlinale, to Bernie, Sidel, Joki, Mohamed. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you, Wes, and Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye.